tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It can be done, it has been done before, but it, it, a lot of factors come into play. A complex mission to rescue a trapped orca calf has been temporarily suspended. We'll find out why. Plus... We believe, you know, the provincial government has overstepped their legal authority. A group of Airbnb owners are taking the province to court over its new short-term rental rules. And... The problem with aging in place, whether you're an artist or not, you can run into isolation. New affordable housing opens in New Westminster, aimed at supporting aging artists. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, I'm Janella Hamilton. Thanks for joining us. Time is running out to save a baby orca that has been stuck in a remote lagoon off Vancouver Island for weeks. A rescue mission was underway today to move the calf into open water, but it was temporarily suspended. Officials held a news conference last hour. Our Yasmin Renea has been monitoring the latest and joins us now. Yasmin, why was the rescue called off? Janella, the Department of Fisheries and Ocean simply says the orca was not ready to be moved today. The rescue mission, unfortunately, unsuccessful. It started out around 5 o'clock this morning, involving dozens of people planning to use a massive sling to lift the calf out of the lagoon and transport it into open water. They had heavy equipment, including a crane, to try and pick up the calf and move her. Frustrating for the team when we're not... We're not successful today, but we're not going to stop. We're going to keep going. We used everything in our toolbox. This animal is extremely smart and, and learning very quickly. So we really only have had a few chances at this, and the animal has adapted. The two-year-old orca has been trapped alone in the tidal lagoon near Zabalo since March 23rd when its pregnant mother died. It's a very complex mission. Experts, including First Nations members and whale scientists, have been trying to come up with the best plan to free the calf. For weeks, they've been considering a number of scenarios, including at one point the possibility of airlifting the young orca by helicopter. They say their current plan certainly wasn't the preferred path, but more of a last resort. It's something that we wish we didn't have to do because it's obviously very stressful for the animal and it can be dangerous. Um, but at this point, it's pretty the best, um, the, the, this animal's best chance of, uh, of going back to the open sea and then hopefully finding a, a family group to, uh, to live with. Now, Janela, the calf has essentially been trapped by the tides in the lagoon, so they need to lift her out and move her to the other side of a bridge where the waters eventually open up to the ocean. DFO says the orca evaded several attempts to coax her into the shallow end of the lagoon, saying it returned to the area it has been hanging out in. So, Yasmin, what happens now? Well, rescuers say they're going to try a different tactic. They say they're going to try to trap the orca in deeper water and are looking to bring in a bigger boat. But they say planning will likely take a couple of days. It's unlikely they'll try again until Sunday or Monday. They say the calf is doing well, all things considered, but officials say the orca's skin is starting to turn white due to the saltiness of the water, and they're unsure if she's eating. So time is definitely of the essence, Janela. Thanks, Yasmin. That's Yasmin Rene reporting live for us tonight. It was a somber day in a remote community as people gathered to find out what may lie below the ground. A search of the grounds of two former residential schools has raised questions and reopened deep wounds. The CBC's Indigenous reporter Jacqueline McKay traveled to a house it on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Two former residential schools only accessible by boat were located on a Housit territory here on these islands. A Housit Indian residential school ran from 1904 until it burned down in 1940. Christie Indian Residential School opened in 1900 and was one of the last schools to close in BC in 1983. Somebody decided our parents weren't going to be good parents. How dare they? This week, members of the nation, former students and family came together to hear what a team tasked with uncovering the truth and locating the children who attended these schools have found. 
We need to do more in order to understand. Ground penetrating radar findings showed that likely and potential unmarked grave locations were noted on both former school grounds. It was a very emotional day today. Greg Louie is the former elected chief of a Housett First Nation and a survivor of the Christie Indian Residential School. Today, he says he thinks about his sister, mother and grandmother who were also taken to the residential school. He says hearing the findings is scary, but a step forward in healing. And really up until the uh, uh, Kamloops Nation uh, made this announcement about the 215, then I really became open about it as uh, personally and as a leader. I had no choice but to speak about it. The National Center for Truth and Reconciliation lists 23 child deaths at the Christie School and a further 13 at a house it. But the work here is meant to find those who are not reported in these numbers. The team, made up of a house it community members and experts, don't want to share numbers of potential graves just yet. We, we need to investigate some more and clarify and confirm, mostly confirm, that, that uh, it's either or, you know, we don't want to be telling, not telling the truth. The research team spoke about the many inconsistencies between what survivors know to be true and what is documented in archival material, like stories of slugs in milk, worms in oatmeal and maggots in the food, which is contrary to archival reports of menus served at the schools. We're getting close to confirming some of the, you know, what we've been told, yeah, you know, that uh, not that we don't believe our people, but, but we need to confirm it for the rest of the world. We've always known what the truth is. Anne Atlio, the residential school research project manager, says they have more work ahead of them. There are stories of children being taken from the Christie Indian Residential School up to the mountain or lake who never returned and still need to be investigated. In securing long-term funding and better access to archival records is needed to continue this work. Ahosid is going to continue with phase two of the residential school project, speaking to more people and looking for more evidence. I'm Jackie McKay for CBC Indigenous in a house at First Nation. This coverage can be upsetting and invite painful feelings or memories. If you or someone you care about is looking for support, you can call the National Residential School Crisis Line at 1-866-925-4419. It operates 24 hours a day and is available for survivors, intergenerational survivors and their loved ones. A group of property owners offering short-term rentals is seeking a judicial review into new provincial rules. As Mira Baines reports, they also want final compensation and a court injunction to delay new regulations limiting short-term rentals from being enforced on May 1st. A petition was filed in BC Supreme Court challenging new short-term rental rules that would restrict these types of rentals to principal residences or a secondary suite. Three petitioners, West Coast Association for Property Rights and Amala Vacation Rental Solutions and its CEO Angela Mason are taking the province and city of Victoria to court seeking a judicial review. The review would determine whether the legislation is fair and lawful. We believe, you know, the provincial government has overstepped their legal authority. The review would determine whether the province had the authority to make the decision it did. The 290 property owners are also asking for a court injunction to delay enforcement of the new rules on May 1st while they await a review and they're also seeking financial compensation. If it creates tangible losses for our constituents, then compensation should be paid for these citizens. This legislation is a problem because it actually harms a very small number of legal operators, licensed operators uh, that have been owners and operating within the laws for years. The zoning allowed to do so. The Ministry of Housing said in a statement, we're taking action to rein in short-term rentals and turn more units back into homes for people. As this is a matter before the courts, the ministry is unable to comment on this specific situation. The City of Victoria says its lawyers are reviewing the petition. So far, no court date has been scheduled. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. 
The B.C. government is scrambling to explain whether a private accounting firm running a grant program is taking kickbacks. The Auditor General is now investigating grants administered by MNP after allegations about a conflict of interest arose. And as CBC's Michelle Gassoub explains, there are still many unanswered questions. There's a controversy that played out in the BC legislature this week that's getting a lot of attention. You might have heard about a story involving clean energy grants, a potential conflict of interest, and now an investigation by the Auditor General. So let's break down what you need to know to understand the story. Since 2020, BC has offered $30 million grants to companies who develop commercial vehicles that produce fewer emissions. It's called the Commercial Vehicle Innovation Challenge, and one business owner decided to apply. His company makes a plug-in hybrid semi-truck, and he thought they'd have a pretty good chance at getting this funding. He says he heard from a company called MNP, offering to write the grant, and all but guaranteeing that they would get it. MNP would take a 20% cut of the grant as payment if they were successful. But he said that was just too expensive. Other grant writing fees are nowhere near that high. His company didn't get the grant, and he started wondering if his proposal being rejected had something to do with him declining to work with MNP. He then learned that MNP allegedly wasn't just writing applications for the grant, it was possibly also administering them, a potential conflict of interest. We're saying that the company is doing a hell of a lot of things in the government that makes it seem like they have a lot of control. And because of that control they have, we felt very pressured into signing up with that company. I don't know, the whole thing is just so complicated. In February, Barber traveled to Victoria because the province was celebrating his new hybrid truck. He said he then told political staffers about this alleged conflict of interest. Give a little update on the government of BC and MNP conflict of interest scandal we've been involved in. He also posted about the ordeal in a series of TikToks that went viral. And that's where all of this really began to take off. BC United began to raise concerns at the legislature. Uh, of course grant programs are supposed to be fair and they're supposed to be transparent, but nothing is further from the truth under the administration of this minister. At first, the BC NDP mostly shrugged off the allegations, but that all changed Monday. The government said new information had come to light and that it would be ordering the Auditor General to investigate how the grants were administered. So when we had new information shared with us this past weekend, we knew the serious questions that it raises, further questions that it raises, it's very important to ensure not only that there is fairness, there's a perception of fairness, that this is fair for all applicants, and that's why we're going to get to the bottom of it. To be clear, we still don't know what that new information that triggered the investigation is. Now, how has MNP responded to this? Well, they've denied that they were receiving kickbacks, saying in a statement, these allegations are false and misleading. They've also deleted information from their website about their involvement in the grant programs. Now, there's a lot we still don't know about this story, and there are a few things that we should make clear. The province said they started looking into this back in February, when Chase Barber first raised concerns. But they also said the grant he was applying for was not administered by MNP. That being said, if the government is now ordering an investigation, it means they have information that is concerning to them. For now, we don't know how long this investigation might take and when exactly we might learn more. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. Yesterday, the province tabled legislation designed to eliminate systemic racism from public bodies. Some First Nations leaders are calling the move historic. It's been a long time in coming, for sure. Um, we haven't really had anything in government that held public institutions accountable for how they treat Indigenous peoples. Their proposed legislation would require the development of a public action plan based on the experiences of racialized British Columbians. The Attorney General's ministry would have the power to issue compliance orders if it finds a lack of response to the plan's recommendations. A B.C. woman is accused of defrauding her employer of nearly $2 million. Investigators are now trying to recover the money and believe other organizations may also have been impacted. As Yasmin Khrenea reports, the woman is alleged to have used diverted funds to buy an expensive car and gold. 
Galina Kulikova worked as a bookkeeper for the Alacrity Foundation of BC starting in 2021 before resigning last October. This according to court documents obtained by CBC News. They allege Kulikova started wiring money from Alacrity to her personal accounts in February and claimed she made grant payments from the organization to several bank accounts that she owned. The final sum allegedly taken? More than $1.8 million. Kulikova is accused of using diverted funds to buy a property in Nanaimo, a 2023 Mercedes-Benz, exchanging $100,000 to euros, buying more than $170,000 in gold, and transferring over $700,000 to Wealthsimple investment accounts. Kulikova is charged with theft, fraud, and laundering proceeds of crime. Kulikova's former employer, Alacrity, also known as Alacrity Canada, is an organization that supports entrepreneurs with grants and training. It says it has seven offices in Victoria, Vancouver, and around the world. It says it remains in strong financial health in 2024, and no programs or initiatives will be, nor have been, affected by this incident. Victoria Police say investigators have recovered about $900,000 that Kulikova allegedly stole and are still working to recover the rest. None of the allegations have been proven in court. Kulikova's lawyer declined to comment. CBC News reached out to Kulikova via social media but did not hear back. Her next court date is May 15th. Meantime, police say they suspect Kulikova may have allegedly stolen from other organizations she worked with and are asking anyone with information to contact them. Yasmin Ghaneya, CBC News, Vancouver. To an interesting story out of the B.C. Supreme Court now. A judge has ruled the actions of a Nanaimo couple were fraudulent after they transferred their home to their son to avoid paying nearly $450,000 in damages. The CBC's Jason Proctor spoke about the case with our Beneath Breach. Jason, there's so much going on here, so tell us what, what's going on. <laughs> okay, so the root of this is this assault that occurs back in uh, 2013. This guy named Hei Huang hits another guy named Jian He. Jian He sues Hei Huang and uh, ultimately ends up getting a judgment against him for uh, about $450,000 because wow. he perforated his eardrum and, and gave him PTSD. But in the middle of the legal proceedings, it later emerges that He Huang sold his house, transferred it over to his son for one dollar and natural love and affection. And so Jian He goes to collect his money. There's nothing there. So he goes back to court. And that's how this kind of situation ends up there. So what he what it later emerges is that the couple uh, who sold the house tried to argue that it was Chinese custom because their son was getting married for them to transfer all of their belongings basically over to him and that also as part of the same custom he would have to look after them uh, into their old age uh, basically and take care of all their finances because they had absolutely nothing left to pay off Jian He because they'd yes, they'd given him give all, all of him. their money. So the judge looks at this and says well, that's kind of ludicrous. I have no evidence that this is Chinese custom whatsoever. And also, the marriage never happened. Uh, the relationship between his son and this uh, woman uh, from China fell apart after six months. Wow. Okay, so what happens to the house now? Well, so basically, the judge has ordered uh, that this sort of the courts look at it as though it never happened. So that Jian mm -hmm. He, after all these years, this is 11 years after this assault happened, can wow. finally claim the $450,000 that a court had said he was uh, uh, due because of this assault. Well, $1 for natural love and affection for home. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. The glamour of life as a starving artist starts to lose its appeal as time goes on. But a new social housing development aims to house those who live to create. Ed C. U. Loverin has more on a housing project that generates security for those often unable to find an affordable home. Slip. There we go. <laughs> Homes for artists. That's the mission for this housing charity. A lot of performers, so actors, dancers, musicians, they, they work paycheck to paycheck. Pal Vancouver has partnered with BC Housing and Vintop Development Corporation. The outcome? 66 units of affordable housing for working and retired artists, many 
who are seniors. It's remarkable because the problem with aging in place, whether you're an artist or not, you can run into isolation. Ellie O'Day lives in the Pal Cole Harbor building, an existing home for artists in the downtown core. She says this housing model fosters community. So we come together and we make our family. And we have an opportunity by living together to collaborate. The mix of studio and one-bedroom units range from 800 to 1350 a month. Applications are available on PAL's website and already there's a lot of interest. We haven't had any move-ins yet. We will at, by the end of the month. It will take a couple months probably three, four months to get it fully, fully tenanted. It takes a lot of visionaries to create social housing, and it is only achieved with a lot of hard work by too many to adequately think. <laughs> Pal Vancouver started nearly 20 years ago. Its first project was an eight-story housing and theater complex. But demand for spots in Coal Harbor well exceeds supply. Like we do at Cardero, our Cardero Street building, at any given time we have 100 people on our wait list. Some people on the Vancouver waitlist may qualify to live in the new Westminster project. If there weren't places like this for them, um, they die alone or they have mental health issues because of isolation and someone decided that that's not acceptable. So, um, A place for artists to live and create and not worry about the insecurity of a home. Edzi Ulevrin, CBC News, New Westminster. The Canadian Dental Care Plan is set to start providing coverage to seniors next month. Over 1.6 million seniors have already signed up for the program. It will roll out to the broader population in 2025. CBC's Gurpreet Cambo asked people in downtown Vancouver how they feel about the plan. I think it's great. It's, it, people need it for their health and wellness. You know, we're paying these pay taxes for something, you know, that should be one of them. Oh, I'm waiting to sign up. You know, I think next month I get to sign up. It's based on your age, you know, and so um, I think it's brilliant. I don't know why we didn't have one before. It's a, a right that people have health care. I think it's awesome, and I think people overlook the NDP's involvement in that. Uh, it's not the Liberals doing it, it's the NDP doing it. And, uh, yeah, I think we should have more... Uh, funding towards uh, social programs like that. Being able to eat properly, your digestion, you feel great, you can smile without, you know, feeling embarrassed. Well, because you can see so many poor people, or disadvantaged people on the streets don't have uh, dental care and it shows, so if they can get free dental claim, that's wonderful. For, uh, fun, fun thing about it is that you don't know the final price until it's done. Yeah, and like, I actually need to go back I think it's a good idea. If it has to cause any deficit to the government, let it be. But the elders have to be in a good state, you know. I'm always concerned about over-government spending and the deficit and whatnot. So, yeah, I think it's, it's something we need to do. I think there's a lot of other areas where they could cut back on to, to pay for this. But. But not everyone is happy about the plan. The BC Dentists Association says the current contract allows the government to change the terms of the deal at any time. That's problematic, and I think anybody who would sign any kind of contract would be very hesitant to sign a contract with such terms. The association says the government is also demanding significantly more paperwork than insurance companies, requiring costly administrative time. They say the 18-month timeline, part of the confidence and supply agreement between the Liberals and the NDP, was unrealistic to create a good plan. Darius Madavi joins us now with a first look at our weather, and it was another beautiful day, Darius. Oh, yes, and we have many more of those on the way. In fact, not really anything else but nice days ahead. Uh, no rain in sight. The last of it cleared out early this morning uh, by around 9 a.m. Really, uh, none of Metro Vancouver was experiencing more than an isolated shower, and now we've dried out entirely. And it's a similar story really across the province, because if we take a look, you can see uh, besides a little bit continuing in the central interior into the afternoon, and maybe a little bit in some of the more southern parts of the province into the early afternoon, we've pretty much dried out, and we're not expecting any more uh, significant flurries or showers 
really anywhere except maybe the East Kootenai seeing a little bit overnight tonight, maybe in the Thompson a brief shower. But really, we're pretty dry going forward. And so here in Vancouver, all we can really expect is uh, nothing but sunshine ahead, maybe a little bit of fog tomorrow morning. Thanks so much, Darius. Thank you. Every April, six around the world gather to mark Vasaki. It celebrates the creation of the Order of the Khalsa in 1699, a defining moment in the Sikh faith. Our Tarnjeet Palmer spoke with community members in Vancouver about how they're preparing for the celebration. Today here, uh, it's a Vasaki. This is a heritage month for the Sikhs. It is a big deal. I think it's about time that we got recognized. And it's a beautiful thing that the city recognized us, recognizing us, what we've done in the past, how all the community has developed, what they've done, what our ancestors have done, how our, uh, you know, our forefathers have done for the community. When Sikhs arrived in Vancouver, over 125 years ago. They were discriminated against. When reflecting on where we came from to where we are today, we can see that the Sikh community has flourished in Canada while remaining proud of its history, culture, faith, and identity. The Sikh community has built our nation and it should be celebrated. I think when we take into account the fact that the city of Vancouver is really the home to the, lar to, um, the oldest Sikh Gurdwara in North America, the Second Avenue Gurdwara, um, and also to the Punjabi market where so many generations of the Sikh community have gathered for, for decades. Um, it really does come as a surprise that this is the first occasion that Sikh Heritage Month or the Sikh community has been recognized in this type of a formal manner, but it's heartwarming to see. We're the legendary Sikh writers. We're actually, uh, uh, when in 2000, when the Sikhs were given the, the, the rights to wear a turban and uh, ride a motorcycle, our main goal is that uh, we hold our identity what our gurus gave us. Gatka self defense ya, pehle tha. Fir e bhi Guru Harjan Sahib Pasha ne apnu e vidya di daad di. Bi kisi di tusi rakhi taan kar sade, tusi khod apni rakhi kar sade. So basically, jada gatka unu shorti nu kende par jada e saara e nu kende sekhmar salat. So Guru Gobind Sahib Pasha ne e nu saare ali jaruri karta bi tusi apne baaste jime hone the self defense diya baakwa kijaga hai ki tusi inne jogi omo bi je kisi di rakhi karne pehle to nu apni rakhi je apni nahi kar saka pa kisi di karne. So e the bhot badiya galle bi e the jodo e the galle hogi saare nu pata lagu abe sekhanda mar salat ya sekh jide o self defense. Being a Punjabi or being as a Sikh, it's it's something to be proud of. It's for the younger people, it's something to be proud of. If they are feeling scared to not tie a turban because they think they would be targeted but getting the proclamation in the city now they have that assurance that you know they can be who they are and they can be choose and and that's what Canada is about being proud of your identity and being able to do what you wish to do and and have your religion and practice it properly Meanwhile, the city is anticipating thousands of people will be making their way to South Vancouver on Saturday for the Vasaki Parade. Road closures will be in place from 10 o'clock in the morning to 6 in the evening. It will affect some major routes, including Southeast Marine Drive, Main Street and Fraser Street. Those planning to attend are encouraged to walk, bike or take transit. We know here in BC, wildfires are expected during the summer, but our furry friends may not. After the break, how to keep your pets safe during wildfire season and how one animal rescue team plans to help livestock that are impacted. Thank you for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Residents who were worried that a frozen sailboat, uh, pardon me, a sailboat frozen in the St. John River would end up at the bottom are now saying, I told you so. All that remains visible of the 13 meter sailboat are two masts above the surface of the water. Now Transport Canada has given the owner until the end of the month to remove it or face fines. Our Mia Urquhart spoke with one nearby resident. So I'm going to start by asking you what your concerns, what your initial concerns were for the boat that's now on the bottom. Um, 
Well, some environmental concerns for sure with the fuel and so on, but more of a safety concern. Um, if anything happens there, there's if the fire department here, we can't do anything on the water or on the ice. Um, it has to come to shore before we get involved, and that would take a while for other fire departments to, to do that. So when that comes out of the water, it'll be a, a sigh of relief for us for sure. Locals probably know that it's there, but what what happens when, when other people start moving back into the community for the season? One of the first things they'll do is put their jet ski in or their little boat or maybe a bigger boat. And, and if they don't see it, they get a little close. If they do see it, they're going to kind of get curious and check it out probably. So that probably won't happen for a few months. So hopefully things can get cleaned up before then. But And do you hope that the officials and maybe boat owners have learned a lesson from this? What would that be? I would hope so. Um, never take this river for granted. It's a, it's a large body of water. Um, we're blessed to have it in our backyard. But as far as leaving something in all winter, um, you can't leave an ice shack on, on the ice without being harassed if you do leave it on. So how can you not leave a boat there? This week, we're taking a look at how different parts of our province are preparing for the wildfire season. Last year, pets and livestock owners in nor pet and livestock owners in northern BC and in the interior struggled to protect their animals from smoke and had to be prepared to evacuate. We have all their crates on standby. We have a trailer hooked up to a vehicle in our parking lot. Our staff has been incredible. They were up um, all night last night working in shifts, just walking the perimeter, making sure that no burning debris came down there. In the Okanagan, one organization is anticipating another year of rescuing and sheltering domestic animals and livestock from areas impacted by wildfires. Daryl Myers is the president of the Animal Lifeline Emergency Response Team. Thanks for joining us, Daryl. It's really good to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, your organization has rescued hundreds of animals during last year's wildfire season. What was the most challenging part of last year? Probably the most challenging part were that there were so many fires burning all at the same time. So our volunteers were spread really thin from the Soyuz border all the way up to Kelowna. And that so many people just weren't prepared with their, with their animals. So on that note, how are you preparing to help animals this year? And do you have capacity to do that? Well, what we're hoping is we're hoping that people, rem if they have a grab and go bag for themselves, that they make sure that they have one for their animals. So it's so important for them to be ready. It's important for them to also know that if you can't have your animal stay with you at a hotel, where are you going to put your animal? Livestock owners should know that they need to have trailers ready. They need to have crates for chickens. Um, if your horse hasn't been loaded for years and years and doesn't know how to get in a trailer, you need to practice that now. So that if 
emergency and evacuations happen, you're able to take care of most of it. We'll come in and help anybody that certainly needs the help, for sure. And how is your organization preparing to help the animals? Um, are you feeling anxious about it? Are you, you know, preparing with different supplies and, and game plans? Yeah, so we have, a, we're preparing a couple of our facilities. We have a facility in Oliver where we can take livestock. We have a facility in Penticton for livestock and one for domestic animals. So we're in the process right now of getting everything ready, getting uh, chicken coops built, getting stalls ready, getting uh, supplies um, to be able to take animals in and house them if people aren't able to take care of them. We're putting our crews together to, and training them to be able to do rescue and to be able to do maintenance where we will go in and feed people's animals um, if they have to leave them behind. Why, Daryl? Why do you do all of this great work to, to help the animals impacted by wildfires? Well, I was caught in the 1994 uh, fire here in Penticton, uh, and I had to leave. I had a lot of animals at that time and small children, and we had to leave a lot of animals behind when we were evacuated with the Garnet Fire, and it was devastating for us. We didn't lose anything, but my kids were crying because we had to choose who we were going to take and who we had to leave behind. And it was, it was just a really, really difficult situation. So we hope that people don't get caught in that situation and that's why our volunteers do what they do. Daryl Myers is the president of the Animal Lifeline Emergency Response Team. Thank you so much, Daryl. Thank you so much for having me and everybody be prepared. New details on the federal housing plan revealed the supports coming for renters and the Prime Minister's appeal to provinces to do their part. That's after the break. It's a lively, competitive, and valuable opportunity for chuck wagon drivers hoping to take home first place at the Rangeland Derby. Honestly, don't know what to say. It. I did not expect that. Chris Molly walked away with the biggest prize of the night, the top bid of $210,000. That's 40,000 higher than last year's top bid. Everything I make off sponsorship, I put back into the team and to improve and continuous improvement to make the team bigger, better, faster. And that's what you want. At the end of the day, we all want to be champions, and that's where we put our sponsorship dollars to. The auction brought in more than $3.1 million total, an improvement on last year's 2.75, and a good sign for the future, says Stampede President Will Osler. It tells me that our sponsors are committed to the sport. They're committed to the Rangeland Derby, the Stampede, and to the, to the drivers and their families. And yeah, it sets up a great 2024 racing season. The Calgary Stampede officially begins with the parade on July 5th. Joe Horwood, CBC News, Calgary.
The federal government unveiled new details surrounding its housing plan today. Its focus is getting rental homes built. As Rafi Bujikanian tells us, Justin Trudeau also threw down the gauntlet for provinces and municipalities, saying they need to do their part. We are releasing the most comprehensive and ambitious housing plan ever seen. The federal governments have seldom built housing strategies in this country. This is Justin Trudeau's second shot at it. Years ago, he focused on affordable housing. Now, with skyrocketing monthly mortgage and rent payments, Ottawa has rental housing in its crosshairs. We're going to do that by reducing the cost of home building, by putting tax incentives on the table for builders, low-cost financing. We're also going to be launching new measures that help unlock federal lands. The government's launching $15 billion in more loans, the goal to spur the construction of at least 30,000 new rental units over the next year. And some of that will be on public lands, the government opening up its own portfolio for either sale or lease. We're seeing language and a scale of an initiative that I've never seen before. The financing amounts and opening up of more land will start putting a dent in the housing gap, this developer says, and more rental units will improve the overall market. Uh, the risk, of course, is that rental housing is so incredibly expensive that there's nothing left at the end of the month to start saving for a down payment. So having a little bit of a surplus or oversupply of rental housing would be really good. But as Ottawa muscles in on turf it does not usually touch, some are crying foul. They've swooped in and they've got a special deal with Edmonton, a special deal with with, uh, with Calgary. They've handpicked six different municipalities to work directly with and left uh, over 340 other municipalities out in the cold. We just don't think that's fair. Trudeau was hammered months ago for saying housing is not a primarily federal responsibility. He's now pushing back. Provinces should be careful what they wish for. They want the federal government to fix this housing crisis? We are. We will. We are there to work hand in hand in full respect with those provinces who want to solve the problem and ask those provinces that don't want to solve the problem to just get out of the way. Ultimately, though, it's consistent messaging on cost of living issues from the federal Conservatives that's pushed the government to act on housing policies. The Liberals' electoral fortunes have yet to improve in opinion polls. The budget next week might be their biggest test yet. Rafi Wujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. The head of CSIS is defending the spy agency's work in handling intelligence and election meddling attempts. This after the Prime Minister said it's his job to question that intelligence and call out any contradictions. Ashley Burke has more on the testimony on the last day of this stage of the public inquiry into foreign interference. David Vigneault. The head of Canada's spy agency back to face more questions and defend his agency's work. As a director of CSIS, I think it's important that we understand that uh, intelligence is a little bit like a puzzle. David Vigneault appearing virtually as this stage of the public inquiry into foreign election meddling wraps up. Sometimes, you know, through uh, use of raw intelligence and assess intelligence, we are building that picture. But I think what is important to remember is that uh, this is done by uh, professional, uh, trained uh, intelligence analysts. That comment after the Prime Minister said yesterday it's his job to question intelligence about foreign interference threats from CSIS. We have a role to play in, uh, in uh, asking questions, on thinking critically, on encouraging further work, on questioning sources and uh, pulling out contradictions. Over 10 days, 40 witnesses testified about countries like China's attempts to influence the past two federal elections. The commission heard the results weren't impacted, but there were vulnerabilities exposed. The community doesn't feel safe. Diaspora groups said they don't feel protected. It touches your life. It touches your safety. It touches your security. Candidates who said they were targeted called out the government for failing to warn them until it was too late. It's almost like I was drowning and they are watching. And the prime minister's inner circle said CSIS didn't communicate everything it wrote down on paper about the threat. We have never heard language uh, like the stuff that, are, that is in this, uh, in this document.
The commission will now start working on its interim report that's due next month before launching into the next phase of this public inquiry, which is investigating if Canada has the capacity to counter this threat. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Trillions of insects known for their unique sound and appearance are emerging from the ground this summer. More on the winged creatures after the break. Young people on Instagram will face new barriers if they send or receive nude photos. The idea is that temporarily blurring images can prevent abuse and blackmail. But child advocates say Instagram's parent company Meta isn't doing enough. It really seems like a band-aid approach and the responsibility still rests with kids to keep themselves safe and there's just so much more these platforms can be doing. If the app automatically detects a nude, it will prompt users to tap an extra button to see or send it. If they do, the image goes through. In a statement, Meta said nudity protection will be turned on by default for teens under 18 globally and will show a notification to adults encouraging them to turn it on. Experts point out users can just go elsewhere. They're going to go to other platforms like Snapchat and Wiz that don't have these kind of current safeguards or regulations, and they're going to start using those platforms. And there's concerns about how automated detection would work because AI can make mistakes. Including through sort of a discriminatory um, overreach into some types of conversation and not others or or sort of a discriminatory approach to content moderation and what images come down or what conversations come down and are flagged and which ones are not. It's not clear when these features will take effect. Meta has said it's testing them, but researchers point out there's no accountability. There's no need right now for them to share the data. How effective are these measures? They will 100% be collecting that data, but they don't have to share it with anybody. One thing isn't blurry. Anyone of any age isn't blocked from sending nudes on Instagram because the app doesn't require proof to say you're old enough. And he's hit already. CBC News, Calgary. Hey, I'm Rohit Joseph. Vibin is the new show all about discovering great new songs and fresh artists from across BC and beyond. Stream Vibin on CBC Listen. Darius Madavi is back with a look at our weekend weather. Darius? Well, we've got uh, not too much excitement on the way unless you're in the northwest or on the north coast where we are seeing a little bit of precipitation that will continue. Otherwise, we've got a little bit of cloud coming for the northern half of the province that will start to make its way down south uh, a little bit as we head into the weekend. This is one of the models that's showing uh, the most cloud, so I would take this with uh, you know a bit of a grain of salt. I wouldn't expect to see quite this much, much more scattered than this, much looser, uh, lots of gaps for sunshine in between here. But we will see that cloud come down at some point 
point on Saturday. So a little bit of a cloudy period for Vancouver and much of the island, but very brief, I would say. Uh, on Sunday, this model is showing a lot of cloud building in. At the moment, this is likely not going to come until later, but the other models don't go out far enough, so I had to show this one. But you can see here on Monday morning, a little bit of scattered showers in the valley that may make their way to some of the higher elevations in Vancouver, but for the most part, we're dry over the next week. I don't expect to see too much at all. Maybe those showers return for the valley again on Tuesday morning, but really there's nothing happening except the, uh, except the temperatures. That's going to be the main weather story this weekend and into next week. We're going to see those temperatures come up tomorrow, stay up on Sunday before seeing a pretty significant drop on uh, Monday, especially if you're further inland or in the valley uh, up at Whistler, um, really anywhere that's not on the water where temperatures will drop just a couple degrees. If you're further inland, they're going to drop as much as as, uh, 5 to 10 degrees for parts of the uh, the interior and in the valley for instance it's going to be a, like an 18 degree to 9 degree drop so very significant uh, if you take a look at our conditions for tonight relatively calm same thing into tomorrow those last few showers pretty much tapering off with the exception of in the northwest once again so really not much to talk about Janelle we've got uh, five days of mostly sunshine and a little bit of cloud on the way so overall it's a it's a pretty Boring but calm weather picture. I don't mind it, Darius. And it is Friday, so you know what that means? It's time for a fun fact. As the weather warms up, some communities on the East Coast are in for a surprise. Darius, what winged and legged creatures can they expect this summer? Uh, well, they are called uh, cicadas, and uh, they are pretty much found across the country in terms of uh, being some kind of cicada, but these are special ones. These are called magic cicada. You can see them here. Uh, they are a periodic cicada, which means they either come out every 13 or every 17 years. And when they do, it's just a flurry of winged insect activity. But this year especially, because we have two broods coming out, brood 13, which ironically comes out every 17 years, not every 13 years, and brood 19, which does come out every 13 years. They made it as confusing as possible. Uh, and that means this is going to be the first time in 221 years since 1803 these two broods are out together. So we're expecting over a trillion of these little bugs that will crawl up from the ground, crawl on as many trees and telephone poles as they can, molt into their winged form, and then take flight, mate, and then die again after laying eggs underground for another 13 or 17 years. Those buggy eyes, they, <laughs> they kind of creep me out, but appropriate. Uh, well, thank you so much for that, Darius. Thank you. Coming up, a golden eagle that was found sick and injured last year is finally going home after being rehabilitated by a local First Nation. We'll have that story after the break.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver returns as the exclusive media partner of the Doxa Documentary Film Festival, May 2nd to 12th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, special presentations, and industry events. For festival program and tickets, visit doxafestival.ca and never miss a special programming series, event, or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e newsletter and keep connected with us. Scientists have found coral bleaching is now happening in deeper waters in the Great Barrier Reef and the Coral Sea. I think like if, if the bleaching continues the way it is 50 years from now, so right now we're facing like a big decline in populations, 50 years from now we might be facing extinction. A dive team of researchers found fresh evidence of coral bleaching about 150 meters underwater. Deeper parts of the reef were thought to be insulated from global warming. Australia's Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is the world's largest and best managed marine reserve, but despite extensive protections, the reef is dying. It lost nearly a third of its corals during the last mass global uh, bleaching event about 10 years ago. This year appears to be following a similar trend, with reports of bleaching across the Caribbean and the entire Great Barrier Reef. In happier news, Woodland Cree Nation to the northeast of Edmonton is celebrating a historic event, the release of a rehabilitated young golden eagle. Dozens of community members gathered yesterday to see Tina be released on the riverbank of the North Saskatchewan River, and CBC was there to witness the moment. It was a very special moment because in our culture, in Woodland Cree, we, uh, we believe the eagle is the highest flying winged one. We call them the winged ones. We believe they can go right to the Creator. Take, when we pray to the eagle, they take our prayers right directly to Creator, to God. And that's why we honor it. The release of the eagle, it made me feel honored. It brought comfort. It brought me, felt like it brought me blessings today. Not only to be able to talk about it, to share the prayer, but more importantly, to feel it physically inside on, on my arms. The best way I could describe it is it's a, a feeling of content, of uh, gratitude. And most of all, the fact that to hold that eagle and feel the heartbeat and the moment the drum beat started, it just calmed right down. It's it's always a powerful thing, you know, like it's a very emotional thing. And Tina was found late in the season um, in November, I think, last year, um, Vermilion Provincial Park. By the, the Fish and Wildlife Division actually picked her up. She was fairly docile, she was underweight, she had a heavy parasite load, which so we, we looked after the parasite load and uh, had to force feed her for a little while and then she picked up, you know, and with a bird like that where it's, it's a young bird, hasn't had a lot of experience, a lot of times they just need to mature a little bit, you know, they need to grow up, grow into their body. She's a strong flyer as you saw today, so it was really a, a relief to be able to get her out and get her on her way. In my language, I said, Today is a good day, you're going to go home. This is your land, you're free to roam. And it's an honor to know you and to be part of your life today and helping you with that release. And that from here on, just live a good life. Tina, the golden eagle, flying free. So beautiful to see that, eh? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can watch this newscast on our free CBC Gem app, as well on YouTube and, of course, on our website at cbc.ca. We will have your next local news at 11 o'clock right after the National. Have a good night.